Ah, okay. Okay. Good evening. We're happy to have everybody here this <coughs> evening. Our speaker this evening is Dan Oldehoff from the city of Manhattan. He's the uh, bicycle coordinator and the bicycle transportation plan work. And uh, he's also uh, the lead person with respect to geographic information systems. And he has his background in uh, geography with environmental geology. And we're very happy to have you here and look forward to learning more about what's happening with bicycle planning and bicycle opportunities in Manhattan. Okay, thank you. Um, as he said, I do work for the city of Manhattan. I've been the GIS coordinator there for about nine years. Um, my training is in geography primarily with a minor in geology. Um, the, the, way I came the, the way I became the bicycle coordinator was um, earlier this year there were an uh, avid group of citizens that came forward at a city commission meeting and demanded that we implement the bicycle master plan, finally. That was developed 10 years prior, in 1998. Um, they got hit pretty hard, and they were a little bit stunned, and they just kind of all took a step back and looked around, and they said, oh my God, who can we get to do this? We gotta get somebody in here right now to take care of these people. So, of course, the first person they thought of was, was me, um, the crazy bicycle guy at the city. Um, just a little bit of background, um, my training is in geography and geology. Uh, my passion probably lies in cycling. Um, I've been an avid cyclist since 1995 when I was at Northwest Missouri State. Um, I started mountain biking and I started racing mountain bikes. From there I got into road biking. And after five years or so, any, anything to do with bikes, I was all about it. Um, and I've kind of been that way ever since. Um, I'm the trail superintendent for Fancy Creek Mountain Bike Trails which is at the northeast end of Tuttle Creek Reservoir. Um, I also put on a regional mountain bike race every year up there called the Dirty Little Secret. It's been, yeah. Is that like Randolph? That is around the Randolph area, yes, that's right. Um, that's been voted uh, best race in the region for two years running and it was almost three years in a row. Um, I voted myself my, my vote was cast for another race, and I found out later that I lost by one vote. So it could have been three years in a row, but we won't dwell on that. Um, so I am a passionate cyclist. I live 22 miles from town, and I cycle in to work at least three times a week, um, sometimes five. Um, on bad weather weeks, you know, as, especially in the winter, it, it, it's down to one or two, but I usually like to cycle in at least one time a week. Um, and I average over three throughout the year. So I am very familiar. Um, I live on the northeast side of the lake in an area called Oak Canyon, um, which is very oaky and very canyony, believe it or not. Um, it, uh, so I'm very familiar with um, the pains and the aggravations of the cyclist in Manhattan. Um, like I said, for the time being, that's why I am the bicycle coordinator. Um, eventually, what I'd like to see is that a full-time permanent position is created and someone with planning background, um, in particular transportation planning, can come in and work within the planning department and do what I'm trying to do now. Um, as, as far as what we're doing right now, I feel like we've got you know, a big fishnet out and any information that comes our way, um, we're just trying to catch that and process it however we can and, um, you know, and, and try, to, try to come up with some kind of Band-Aid remedies. Um, the more I get into this and the more I research um, uh, sustainable communities, um, walkable communities, bikeable communities, um, the more excited I become about what Manhattan could be with the proper planning, with the proper engineering. Um, I've got a short slideshow. I'm not a big fan of slideshows. Um, they're good visually though sometimes to kind of leave a stamp on your brain. So we'll go through this in about 10 minutes and then I'll kind of talk to you about what's going on right now with the city in regards to bicycle transportation planning. You all have some maps in front of you. That's the geographer in me. I cannot let you leave without taking a map home with you. Um, we'll talk about this for a little bit and we'll use this as a reference point for some individual projects that are going on with the city right now. Um, if you've got any questions, 
I'll be available for as long as you want. Um, I know it's the evening, so um, if you feel like getting out of here as soon as I'm done, I don't blame you. Um, but I am, I will stick around for any questions you have. I've got about 40 minutes, maybe, give or take. Yeah. I am riding. Well, I'm not riding home tonight. I'm riding back to City Hall where I left my car. Um, I've got some other things going on, and I've got, um, you know, I, I, every once in a while I drive in and I, I conglomerate my trips. I've got laundry to do, and I've got some grocery shopping to do and things like that. So I'll take care of that all with the car tonight. And I do drive an old Suburban, and it's really horrible gas mileage. So I apologize for that, but I don't drive very much. So maybe I'm just kind of balancing everything out by doing that. I don't know. But I'm doing my part. I'm doing what I can. Um, the first slide you see here, and if you guys are okay, I'll just leave the lights on. Um, if we go through these slides and it starts to be kind of a, a hard thing to see, maybe we can dim them or, or just flip them off. We, don't, we won't spend very much time on these. But the, for this first slide is the cover page for the Bicycle Master Plan that was um, created in 1998. It was a joint effort between KSU and the city of Manhattan. They were forward thinking at that time. In 1998, there wasn't a lot of thought going into multimodal transportation. Um, so they were really ahead of themselves. And it would have been really, really, really fantastic if in 1988, or 1998, I'm sorry, 1998, they took this plan that it was newly created and they started immediately and started engineering the practices that were land, lined out in this. They didn't. This was put on a shelf until about six months ago. Um, nothing was done with it. One of the first things uh, listed in this, ma in this um, manual is the completion of linear trail. It was never done. Um, we're getting to that now, but it was never done. Another thing was looking at a uh, series of networks throughout the city um, that cyclists and pedestrians could use. Um, that was never done. There's a whole host of things. Um, the implementation of a bicycle coordinator, it was just completed in April of this year. Um, the call for uh, incentives to those employers in town that make bicycle facilities available to their employers or employees, including bike racks, bike stations, and showers. Okay, that was never done. There's no incentives for that right now. Um, so this really was when our bicycle master planning started in 1998, when this was completed. Um, there were a few items that were done, and we'll talk about those in a second. Um, when I came on board with the city. Is that better? That'll work. That'll be great. That's great for me if it's okay with you guys. Okay. Um, the League of American Bicyclists is a nationwide organization that um, is responsible for the accreditation of, bi of communities on a level of how bicycle friendly they are. Um, they're the most respected cycling or, or, or organization that does that type of thing. They list five E's, um, and those are engineering, education, encouragement, enforcement, and evaluation and planning. They, when, they, when, when a city applies to be, a bi to be accredited as a bicycle-friendly community, they look at these five different criteria for, for that community, and they evaluate that community on these levels. Um, the engineering, of course, is the design of roadways to meet bicyclists' needs. Um, education includes uh, motorist as well as cyclist education. How many people here um, know that you are not supposed to ride your bike on any of the sidewalks? Okay, a lot of cyclists don't know that. Um, that's part of education. It's not. It's not just about us telling motorists, hey, don't run over guys on bikes. It's about education, ed educating cyclists as well. Um, and children too, as far as that goes. A big part of this is trying to get children to ride their bikes to school, to start walking to school again. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, there's the encouragement. That comes through local bike clubs or other local events. There's bike to work day. There's bike week. Um, there's local clubs that organize weekly and daily rides. Um, there's enforcement. Our relationship with RCPD, how do we get cyclists to ride where they're supposed to all the time? How do we get motorists to, ex to respect those cyclists who are respecting the law? Um, that's the enforcement part of it. And then the evaluation and the planning process of it. 
um, three years from now, when we've started to implement a lot of these things, how well of a job have we done? Um, and what do we need to change? What's working? What can we keep doing? What can we keep encouraging people to do? That's the League of American Bicycle Bicyclists five E's. As far as the city of Manhattan, how have we done so far? Well, you saw the title page to the Bicycle Master Plan, which was completed in 1998. And I just told you that not a whole lot has been done. Um, in 2003, uh, there was a multi-use trail proposed, which is linear trail, the completion of linear trail. Um, there was, a, there was a, a project proposal turned into KDOT, which is the Kansas Department of Transportation, um, that uh, requested funding for a two and a half mile stretch from Browning to Walters Drive that would complete linear trail. Um, in 2003, that was estimated at $914,000, so almost a million dollars for two and a half miles. That's pretty average cost for that length of trail. Um, the most expensive bike trails, the standalone trails that are 10 feet wide, paved with concrete, and have amenities along the side, cost about a million dollars a mile. Um, the least expensive trails, um, we're talking about, you know, uh, a crushed limestone trail that's a lot narrower, that's built on an existing bed, um, an old rail line or a levee system, can cost $5,000 a mile. So there's a huge spectrum in terms of cost. Um, this two and a half miles at about 900,000 is somewhere in between there. Um, today's costs, uh, construction costs have gone way up since then. So it's gonna be well over a million. Um, the rest of these bullets that you'll see are all from 2008. So you'll see that in the term from 98 to 2008, there was only basically that one project proposed. Um, recently, there's been a, uh, a group of, uh, a passionate group of cyclists. Um, some of the city staff wouldn't use the term passionate. Um, I'm gonna use the term passionate. They're an avid group of cyclists and they've stepped forward, thank goodness, and demanded that this uh, ma bicycle master plan be implemented. Let's start doing the things that we proposed 10 years ago and let's start doing them now. Um, in April of 2008, I was named the interim bicycle coordinator. Um, I am still the interim bicycle coordinator. I don't plan on doing this forever. Um, I'm having fun doing it now. And as I mentioned before you all showed up to these guys, I'm having a really, really great time being the first person in here kind of just stirring things up and screwing everything up for the next person to come in and really be the bicycle coordinator. He'll be like, oh my gosh, who did this? Whose idea was this? And that'll be the next person. But for now, that's me. So I'm having a good time. Um, most recently, there was a, a trail that was proposed on an abandoned rail line along K-18 and US-24 to Bluemont Avenue. Um, that was this year. And that coincides with the South End Redevelopment Project, a downtown redevelopment project. And that's a, a rail line that goes, that parallels the west side of Tuttle Creek Boulevard um, from the mall up to Bluemont Avenue. Um, so we're starting, to, we're starting to see the light in the city. Um, some of the folks are starting to see the writing on the wall and they're saying, listen, we, you know, we're gonna have to start doing something about all these bikes on the road. We're gonna have to start giving them a place to ride. That's the first project proposed in five years since this one. Um, since this one was proposed, there's been a multitude of considerations made. Um, virtually every new road construction and every repair that comes across the city manager's uh, desk now, he takes into consideration bicycle um, uh, traffic. Uh, if he forgets about it, he doesn't forget for long because I'm not very far away from his office and I remind him all the time. Um, A couple months ago, we sent out a survey to everyone in Manhattan, everyone being defined as everyone who paid a water bill. Um, it was somewhat scientific. It didn't catch the students. Um, it didn't catch anyone who was not an owner of property in Manhattan. Um, we have about 14,000 property owners in Manhattan that we mailed these out to and we, we received almost a thousand surveys back. I was hoping for about 10%, so I was hoping to get about 1,400 surveys back, which would have been a pretty good number. 
Um, but still, I think 900 surveys returned is a pretty good sample size. Um, we'll, I'll go through the results of those surveys here in just a second. Um, also this year, uh, I also hired um, a planning intern for bicycle, strictly for bicycle coordination. Um, and that doesn't seem like a big deal at first when you look at that. It's like, so, big, so what, big deal? You hired an intern. That happens all the time. The big deal about that is I'm primarily the GIS coordinator for the city, and I do all the bicycle coordination stuff on the side on my own time and without pay. So when I hired a, a planning intern for, for bicycle coordination, I essentially doubled the time spent at the city for bicycle coordination. She works 15 hours a week, and I spend about 15 hours a week on this stuff. So we essentially doubled that time, which has helped a lot for me. And she's getting paid for it, which says something. Um, we most recently implemented the Bike Manhattan webpage. And you guys can get to that by going to the city's homepage. If you don't know what the city's homepage is, if you look at the last part of my email address, the part that's after the at, there you go. That's the city's homepage, ci.manhattan.ks.us. If you go there, we have a permanent link on the front page that says Bike Manhattan. That has all of our latest news. It's, op it's updated at least twice a week with new information. Um, we have uh, questions on there asking you to respond. Tell us where you bike. Tell us what the problems are. Tell us how we can help you. Um, so we've got all kinds of stuff on there. It's got some writing tips. It's got this map on there. This map, by the way, is being updated all the time. Um, this just happens to be this week's version. Seriously. Um, if you go to the web page, we will always have the most up-to-date version on there in a PDF form, and you can print it out. So, um, a week, ex actually exactly a week from today, we'll have an open house at the city, at the city's, uh, um, in the foyer area, right as you go in the front doors. We're asking everyone to come in, especially those people who bike and want to see a, a change and want to see a difference in the city, to come in, talk to myself, um, Victoria McKinnon, who is the uh, bicycle planning intern, she'll be there to answer questions. Um, a couple of the, the city commissioners will be there, the city engineer will be there, and we might possibly have the mayor there as well. So if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, any comments, come meet us on the 16th, a week from today, um, from 6 to 8. I know you guys are probably in class, but maybe you can um, talk to your instructor into letting you out. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking maybe you can talk to your instructor into letting you go to that instead. Maybe you get credit for the class or something like that. I don't know. That's my opinion. Um, so come see us on the 16th if you can. Let's, I'll just briefly run through these, the, the survey results really quick. Um, again, we sent these out in the late part of May and the early part of June um, to all the households who received a water bill. They went in with the water bill, and we asked people to return those voluntarily. Um, we got 900 of them back. Um, we, it's, it's really, it's, it's just really short and sweet. Um, we asked people about the use of bicycles in Manhattan. Um, we asked them a series of questions to find out, do you ride a bike? Where do you ride a bike? How often do you ride a bike? Do you want to ride a bike more? And what's keeping you from doing that? Basically is what we were getting at with this survey. Um, the first question asks, do, do you or anyone in your household ride a bike? Um, 63% of the respondents answered yes, we do, okay? Keep that number in mind, 63%. Keep that in mind because on question four, you'll see another number and it's, it, it should hit you, okay? So 63% of respondents said, yes, I ride a bike right now in the city of Manhattan. Um, we asked them, how often do you ride a bike? Um, the biggest response, 33%, was more than once a week, okay? Um, 21% of the people said daily. So half the people in Manhattan that currently ride a bike ride a bike more than once a week. That actually kind of surprised me. That's a lot of people riding bikes. Okay. Um, just, for the, for, just for easy math, we'll assume, we'll assume Manhattan has a population of 50,000 people. 
I don't know, it could be a little bit above, it could be a little bit below, depending on who you ask, but about 50,000 people. Yeah, question? That's just the respondents. These are just the respondents, yes. So anytime, anytime we talk about the whole population, he's right, we're extrapolating data. Yes, and he's right, that's a good point, that's a good point. Um, that's a great point. The people that are most interested in biking are gonna be the people that are gonna respond to this, and that's something we need to keep in mind. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, it was mailed in May and June, and the only we didn't try to exclude the students, but there's a very, very small window when we're able to use those water billings as surveys, and that was our only time for like the next two years. Um, they can only do it three times a year, and the other time slots were already reserved. So it was the only time that I could do it. And I just, we use this information for a preliminary, uh, kind of a preliminary study. You know, let's just throw these questions out there. Let's just kind of see where people are coming from, okay? Actually, um, yes, Melissa Bopp in kinesiology, Professor Melissa Bopp, she is, um, has done a survey in the past and she's getting ready to send out another survey. Um, not just on bicycling, but actually commuting in general um, for everybody in Manhattan. So watch for that to come out. We'll also use that information from her. Ha has it gone out? Okay. It's a good survey. It's much more comprehensive. It's more like, I want to say 30 to 40 questions. This, this was just sent out to, um, you know, let's just throw this out there. Let's see what kind, let's, let's kind of just see what we're dealing with here. So let me just run through these real quick, and then if you have more questions, I'll take those. Um, I ask people, why do you ride a bike? 96%, um, that's, a, that's a very, very high number. Now, people could answer more than one of these or all of them if they wanted. But 96% of people that responded said they do it for, for recreation or exercise. Um, that was higher than what I expected. The real number I'm interested in is this number right here. Commuting to work or school, 66%, and running errands, 36%, okay? There's three types of cyclists that are described by the League of American Bicyclists. And those same three, three cycl types of cyclists are also described on our bicycle, in our Bicycle Master Plan. There's an A, a B, and a C. An A is a super active cyclist. It's a person that's gonna bike no matter what. It's the person you always see in Lycra. It's the guy you see riding down the highway at. 25 miles an hour in his triathlon position and he's checking his heart rate monitor, okay? Those are the A cyclists. The B cyclist is a basic cyclist. It's a person that, I like to, I like to think of them, they're gonna drive their car as long as we make it hard enough for them not to ride a bike. But if riding a bike becomes a viable option, they're gonna ride a bike. That's a basic cyclist. Now there's a lot of people that are starting to choose to ride bikes now. They go to the grocery store for small trips. Um, they go to see their friends. They go to the movie on the bikes. They go to Aggieville in the evening. They go out to dinner. Um, all kinds of things. They do all kinds of things on bike. Those are the people that I'm most interested in. Those are the people that we want to focus in, on and make cycling a lot more safe and easier for in Manhattan. Okay. Um, the sea cyclist is the children and they're kind of over here by themselves because we discourage people to ride on sidewalks. There's children and elderly actually. And if children are young enough, we actually encourage them to ride on the sidewalk. Um, otherwise they're not gonna feel safe in traffic. But that's a whole different kind of um, entity over here that we have to deal with. Um, we asked them what time of day do you ride? Uh, dawn to 9 a.m., 9 a.m. to four, four to six, six to dusk, and then night. 8% rode at night. Um, you can see the highest percentage rode from 6 p.m. to dusk, 70% said they rode during that time. That's during the weekday. During the weekend, it changes to that. And you can see a spike in 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, I don't know really what that means. I'm guessing that's probably recreational cyclists are coming out during that time on the weekends. It doesn't really do, do a lot as far as our planning goes, but it's good information to have. This is question four. I'm sorry, question six. I lied to you. Remember that number I told you? Remember 63% of respondents said that they currently do ride a bike right now? 
83% of the people that responded, whether they ride a bike or not, said that they would like to start riding a bike or they want to ride their bike more. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's telltale right there. That's something I can take to my commissioners and say, look, you've got 83% of the people in Manhattan extrapolated through our survey results, but I won't say that, that say they want to ride their bike more, um, but they can't for the following reasons. Okay, and we asked them that question. If you said you want to ride more, why? What's keeping you from riding more? Huge number, 98% of people said there's a lack of trails or there is a lack of bikeways. Um, directly related that related to that, 84% responded that they have safety concerns. 62% um, too much automobile traffic. I would say probably that 62% can pigeonhole right into this 84% and then that can be pushed right over to that 98%. Um, those first three are very, very related. Um, 34% poor roadway conditions. That would have been my biggest concern. Um, lack of secure parking facilities. I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Um, and then the rest of these are just personal issues. Not enough time, other, um, my work's too far away, weather concerns, and bicycling in general is not appealing to me, which 6% actually responded. So there were actually people that responded to the survey that didn't bike. They said, no, I don't bike. and. I don't want a bike, and here's your survey back, thank you very much, without a discount on their water bill. Um, this can be a little bit confusing. Um, I asked of the responses that you just responded to earlier, what is the single most important thing to you why you cannot bike, or why you feel like you cannot bike more in the city? 38% again said lack of trails and bikeways, and this kind of loosely corresponds again to the same results that we just got in the previous um, response. So what do we do with these results? What do we do with this stuff? Um, I take this back to the city, city engineer. I take it to the city commissioners. I show them the results. I say, look, people want to ride their bikes more. People, people want this. They want to ride their bikes in Manhattan. What can we do about it? And that's really got, it's really gotten a rise out of our city engineer. Um, and it's really gotten to our city um, commissioners. In case you don't know, um, Jim Chiro and Bruce Sneed are both very active cyclists. Um, any weekend you can see both of them out doing 10, 20, 30, 40 mile an hour, or 40 mile rides. Um, they're active cyclists. They understand this. They get it. Um, a lot of it is just old thinking. A lot of it is um, where do we get the money, especially the way things are going right now. Um, so they, some of them get it. And, and, it, it. and the rest of the city staff is starting to see the writing on the wall. And they're under, understanding that this next big paradigm push in engineering is going to be how do we create a community for multimodal transportation. And that's really what we're getting at. I know I'm talking a lot about biking right now. Um, but we're also talking about pedestrian traffic. We're also talking about sustainable communities and communities that you can walk to the grocery store, that you can bike to a grocery store, that you can go down to a community center, a community garden, um, a neighborhood park, things like this. You know, um, Big box stores and huge parking lots are in direct conflict to that. Um, if you've seen the North End redevelopment, Without getting into too much detail, you, you've kind of seen how um, a really, really great objective can get skewed into something that is just mundane and um, cookie cutter. You know, so I can't say a whole lot about that. But if you if you want to know my personal views on the North End, catch me after class. Okay, we'll leave it at that. So that takes us to this map, um, and I'm going to go ahead and flip these back on. Oh, there you go. Okay, Who, whoever was sleeping in the back, wake up. Okay. Um, so let's just talk about this map for a little bit. I told you uh, one, of my, one of my bullet points was that I said the city has started to look at multiple, a multiple number of projects, um, and they've started to look at new projects, and they've started to look at projects that are revitalizing with the idea of cyclists in mind. Um, 
This is a copy of a map from uh, the 1998 uh, Bicycle Master Plan. I told you it's in flux. It's continually being updated and changed. It was changed today, actually. Um, if you look at the downtown area right here on your map, this is the north end redevelopment area. Um, Manhattan Town Center is right here. The north end redevelopment. Best Buy is right here. Walmart is right here. Okay, just for reference. Um, the south end takes in this area right here. We actually, before today, had this proposed route on 5th Street, on 4th Street. Um, after discussing that with uh, the people that are designing that downtown redevelopment, we decided the bike route would be better fitted on 5th Street. It would keep cyclists away from the heavy traffic. It would also give them a more through street to go on. Excuse me. The, they will actually be on, on the back side of that downtown, and there will be funnel areas going directly into those, those points of interest. Um, Fourth Street, as proposed, is already giving our transportation planners headaches. They know that that Fourth Street is going to become so congested when this is all done. In the next five years, there's going to be major problems. So we've said, let's get the bike lanes out of there now. Let's just forget about that. They've got on-street parking there still. Um, they're talking about taking that on-street parking off in the next five years just to accommodate the traffic that's going to be there, the car traffic question. They don't like one-way streets around here. Um, because I, mean, it, I wonder whether one can say, well, okay, so this street is now officially uh, a bike. Right. Does it mean bicycles will not have anybody on or anything else to do? Yes, no, it doesn't, doesn't exclude bicyclists. No, not at all. It doesn't exclude. But what we're talking about is making accommodations on 5th Street. Um, and we're talking about bike lanes, striped bike lanes on both sides. We're also talking about um, if you drive from this point on Fort Riley Boulevard all the way up to Bluemont Park. Is that Bluemont Park? Good now, Park. Good now, Park. Sorry. I don't know how many stop signs you'll go through, but it's probably in the double digits. You're going to stop a lot. Um, when we put bike lanes in there, one of the things we're talking about doing is taking out all those stops along there and putting the stops on these streets. So someone on a bike can get on their bike and go straight through without stopping. All the traffic will stop for them. Now, there's, there'll still be some stopping points. Um, Fifth Street actually doesn't go, it doesn't cross points. You actually have to travel through the Riley County Courthouse Plaza, um, which can be another actually plus for cyclists. Um, you're talking about traffic moving away from you, um, but all the way up to here on that. So that's just something that we just changed recently. Like, and that's just to um, illustrate how this is kind of in flux. So um, some other projects that are being considered. McCall Road right here. Um, let's just back up for a second. On this map, what you're looking at is obviously the city of Manhattan. The highlighted streets are the existing bicycle lanes. Okay. The red streets are proposed bicycle routes. Pay attention to that wording. Because a bicycle route is not necessarily a striped bicycle lane. We have a bicycle route right now that goes all the way down the west side of campus, right out here. Is that the right way? Right out here on Denison? If you, if you travel that street, there are signs up that say bike route. Bike route, bike route, bike route. Um, that's just a suggested route. There's no stripes. There's no accommodations other than a sign that says bike route. One of my jobs is to take this proposed bicycle master plan and condense this down and spit out where do we want to put bike lanes, where do we want to put bike routes, where do we want to put bike trails, which is something entirely different. A bike trail doesn't have car traffic at all on it. Um, linear trail, 
is a biking slash hiking trail. And you can see that circumnavigates the city, or roughly circumnavigates the city. Um, McCall Road um, has been uh, deemed, it's been deemed necessary, that needs to be completely redone. Our city engineer put in $300,000 to the budget of this um, road reconstruction for bike lanes, for bike facilities. So we're starting, we're starting to get it. We're starting to make accommodations piece by piece. Um, with the completion of this as a bicycle friendly road, we can start to look at how do we get across Tuttle Creek here, which is a huge question. I don't know the answer to it just yet. I've got some ideas, but I don't know the question, or I don't know the answer to the question in terms of the costs involved or, or safety or how, or the traffic involved. I mean, it's a huge barrier. This whole road all the way down through the city, it's a huge barrier for cyclists and pedestrians. But once this is done, then we have a, a key link, you know, or a key piece of the puzzle, puzzle done. We can start continuing bike lanes all the way into campus. We can tie those into North Manhattan Avenue. We can tie those easily into Aggieville and through Aggieville. And then through Fifth Street, we can tie those into the new downtown area. So you can see how just tiny little pieces to the puzzle can start, once they're connected, they can really start to allow for some big traffic flows with bicycle and pedestrian traffic. The key to that is connectivity. It's a big key. That is the number one key. You've got to have bike lanes that are connected. This trail out here. The only time I ever ride on that trail is when I go to see my friends that live out here on Dartmouth. I drive my car out to Dartmouth. We all get on our bikes to go do a bike ride and we just kind of happen to take this bike lane because it's there. Otherwise, who else uses this? Has anyone else been out on and used this bike lane? Anyone? No? Anybody, did anybody even know <laughs> that there was a striped bike lane out there? Okay. It was done because it was new development. Okay. And we started, we started to say, okay, now starting now, we got to start putting bike lanes in. And this just happened to be one of the first streets that we did that on. That's why this one's out here too. How many people ride their bike to go play golf at Colbert Hills? <laughs> I don't. I'm just trying to get somebody else to raise their hand. But it's not happening because people don't do that. Again, it was a new road. Um, it's not making a lot of sense. This is a fledgling endeavor. We're just kind of we're we're, we're, we're kind of trying to feel this out and trying to figure out what to do. Um, short of calling that a mistake, that those are the kind of things that are going to happen. Um, until we really get this figured out, until we see the big picture, and until we get our, our focus set right, these are the kind of things that are going to happen. Now, this one's pretty good. I see cyclists on this all the time. I use this every day I commute into work. I come right down here, and I come right down here like this, um, and straight through down to City Hall, where I work right here. So this is a good one. I like this one. Um, I, tell my, I tell my city engineer, who happens to be my boss, Every week, I let him know, you know what? It really stinks that the lane ends right there. I sure wish I could stay on the lane going up through here. Because when you hit right here, it's a narrow blacktop road, and there's big ditches on both sides. And so I remind him of that often. He's, he's not going to quit hearing from me until that's done. Um, so there's a lot of things we're looking at. Um, uh, yeah, question? On that uh, hill, there's now a wide sidewalk on one side. Yes, there is. Uh, that perhaps could be designated a bike lane, walking lane. Uh, that was that designed as a... Whether people uh, mm -hmm. like to have a, a, a mix of uh, bike lanes. And it's, a po it's a possibility. I actually see cyclists on that quite a bit. Um, that, go ahead, what? Um, North Manhattan Avenue, north of Claflin Road, up to uh, Kimball. Um, it goes by the Baking Institute. Um, there's a nice big sidewalk. Right? Yeah, there's a very nice big sidewalk. It was designed as a pedestrian sidewalk. However, I do see bikes on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a possibility. The problem with that is it's on the west side of the street. Sure. So, for instance, when I'm commuting home, I'm riding in the bike lane on the east side right up until Claflin. Sure. How do I get on that sidewalk? Mm -hmm. We don't know. How do I get through that intersection? I'm stuck, I'm stuck over here in this right lane, 
there's two car lanes plus another bike lane plus another pedestrian right away plus Claflin Road going here and it's a very 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 busy intersection um, especially at the times when I personally cycle through um, so how do I get over to that sidewalk I'm not going to do it mm -hmm. especially as an a cyclist I'm just going to stay on the road and go straight up the hill yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah but it's definitely a possibility it's there um, any other questions about projects that are going on yeah well, what about the connections with k-state campus um, yes, he asked about the connections to K-State K State campus. That is something we're taking into consideration. Uh, I mentioned that we had formed a bicycle advisory board. Um, ben Champion, who is the director of sustainability. Are you Ben? <laughs> I've been trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. You were aware you're on the board, right? I, I'm aware of Okay, invited. great. <laughs> <laughs> we were, you know, I was at, um, we were at the uh, 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 Kansas Health Summit, um, and I was in a, a presentation put on by the um, um, the director, or the uh, bicycle and pedestrian coordinator for Kansas City, and she was talking about how her endeavors in Kansas City, which I would never, ever want to tackle. I grew up in Kansas City, and I cannot imagine the enormity of the job that's ahead of her. But one of the things she did was go around the room and she said, introduce yourself, kind of talk about what you're doing as far as um, bicycle advocacy in your community. And I, you know, I was one of the first people to go. And there were four other people in the room that were from Manhattan. And I was like, that's awesome. I was like, wow, this is like four out of 28 people, maybe, were all from Manhattan. I was like, that's great. So, Ben, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah. Um, so we've got, we've got people from different entities in town. We've got a representative from K-State. We've got a representative from uh, Riley County. We've got a representative from RCPD. Um, USD 383 is represented through Dave Colbert, who is the uh, manager of Pathfinder. Um, we've got a local business representative. Um, and then we've got some at-large citizens. Um, so going back to your question, how do you connect to K-State? Hopefully Ben will help us out with that. Mm -hmm. So. I was hoping you'd be able to answer. <laughs> we'll, we'll work together. We we'll work together. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, any other questions? Yeah, right here. Okay, with the connections to, um, you mentioned Aggie Mill as a, as a big connectivity point. Mm -hmm. um, and with a lot of the transportation that takes place on Bluemont, is there any hope of getting a bike lane on Bluemont Anderson? No. Okay. <laughs> um, let me expand on that. Um, I won't say no hope. It's a major, major traffic arterial, um, a automobile traffic arterial. Not so much pedestrian and bicycle arterial. There are alternative um, streets that we can use. One of the things that I have proposed, proposed with the completion of this um, fifth, street, fifth Street bike lane, I have proposed that we run a bike lane one block north of Lumont straight into campus. And there'll also be one here at Leavenworth that will run into City Park and then a connection to Aggieville. What that does is it gets students from campus all the way across this way to downtown or through Aggieville, heaven forbid, <laughs> to downtown and back. Um, and it keeps them out of this major automobile arterial. Um, now, well, you say, well, there's rentals on Bluemont. What if I live right there? Well, you can take this road and go down. We can't please everybody. We can't take care of everybody. Yeah. How about uh, 11th Street there? Like, you know, 11th Street just runs mm -hmm. past, like, it's on that side of that. Yep. Um, it seems like a good one. Well, it looks like it's... It's, it's, in, it's in the plan for a route. Um, as far as being striped or not, I don't know what status of, is, of that is right now. But it's being considered for a route. So, yeah. I know there's a, just from observation, there's a ton of bike traffic on 11th Street. So, you had, yeah. Yeah, so you said it's a, is it illegal or not wanted to ride on sidewalks? Um, you know, I need to look into my master plan, actually. Um, because in some of these areas, I, our roads are so small that to like actually make a bike lane would be yep. unpractical. I Why think, not just make extra wide sidewalks? I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it's an unenforced ordinance. Right now, 
I've been pulled over yet. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a good point, I think, because I know in Germany, for example, where many more people walk on bicycle, they often have relatively wide sidewalks, uh -huh. and then they have use different colored paving materials yep. to indicate a bike lane just closer to the vehicular traffic and then a pedestrian which is closer to the building. Yep. And so they share, and you know, depending on the amount of uh, pedestrian traffic, car, uh, bicycles are really quite free to go. Yeah, yeah. So um, they're off, they're up on the curb. Too. Yeah. You, you know, Europe, Europe. Most of the most of the larger, especially older cities in Europe, have the advantage over America that they were developed before automobile traffic was prevalent. Um, our cities over here were developed. A lot of them, in a lot of sections of the city, post automobile traffic, and we really catered to the automobile for so long. And now we're kind of stuck. And now it's kind of like, well, what do we do now? And now we're kind of looking back at Europe and going, oh, yeah. But see, the difference, though, is that, I mean, you're right about yeah. that. But in Europe, the streets are one lane this way, one lane the other, whereas in Manhattan, Kansas, we have sometimes four lanes. Totally, totally catered to the automobile, yep. You know, do something about tightening yep. up. And in, in Germany, for example, as one European country, uh, the, the traffic engineers are now so smart that they really uh, take access away from cars. So they make it very easy for pedestrians and bicyclists to move through anywhere they want. And cars have to drive around in order to get there when really the crow flies very directly. Yep. But cars, yep. of course, drivers don't it's, like it. But how, it's how many people have, have been to Europe, larger European city? OK. Mm -hmm. Anybody spent any time in Amsterdam or Denmark, Copenhagen? OK. I went there about 10 years ago, and not being, actually been about 15 years ago, just starting to get into biking, didn't really understand the whole biking, you know, walking around thing. Um, I was just blown away. I just, I was freaked out by all the bike traffic and by all the pedestrian traffic, the rail traffic. A street, a typical street in Amsterdam is, what, eight lanes, you have a sidewalk for pedestrians, bikes, Pedestrians, cars, trains, trains, cars, bikes, people. <laughs> and to stand there coming from America, never being never being too far away from the Midwest, and to look across and see all that, it's just it's just crazy. So, yeah. Um, on the notion of connectivity around Manhattan, um, what about the connections between the green spaces? I noticed with recreation and exercise being the only major reason a lot of people are biking in the area. Connecting to those recreational destinations would would be a key component to this master plan, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, it's one of the things that I am focusing on, um, and that was another reason why we took this Fifth Street all the way straight up to Griffith Park. That gets you to a park. It provides an anchor for that pathway. Um, in other words, that trail isn't just going to a neighborhood. Isn't just going nowhere. In your mind. If you're downtown, you know that this goes to Griffith Park. Oh, that's the Griffith Park Trail. Um, from there, you go over to your next anchor, which is KSU. Um, from here, over this way, the anchor will be the entrance to Linear Trail. So we want to complete trails to anchor points. Um, and a lot of those anchor points are parks. On this map that I've handed out, you'll see every single park in the city labeled. That's not coincidence, OK? Yeah, um, and also the schools are on here, too. Those are other there isn't any route designated to go by the zoo. And, and that would be a big one in, in my initial. That is, and that, but that's a hard one. Um, you can take the trails behind the cemetery. Yeah. Right past the zoo. Yeah, that's, that's one option. And that's the other thing I was yeah. going to get into my next question, is all of these routes and trails are on vehicular paths already. I mean, why not have? trails that go off the road, that go between buildings and, and through green spaces. And we, we have a little bit of land to work with in that regard, but not a whole lot. Um, the, city, the city doesn't own a lot of right-of-way in those types of areas, and it's hard, it's hard enough just to get bike lane striped, and it's hard enough just to get new trails built on existing city property, but to actually go to the commissioners and say, you know what? We want to put a trail here, um, but we're going to have to buy one and a half million dollars of property first. 
before we even get started. That's a hard sell. Oh man, that's a hard sell. So you couldn't go ahead and use that's that would that definitely that's definitely something that is in the in the master plan, um, but it's a lot further down the road. Yeah, but it's yeah. So there was a K State master student who wrote a master's thesis, uh, kind of analyzing what it takes to put in bike lanes. Yeah. Kind of analyzed the master plan as well. It was 2003. Was it Chad Bunger? I, I can't remember that guy's name. Okay. Right, but uh, it sounds like you're generally familiar with it. Uh -huh. I was curious what kind of headway you're making as far as what he basically concluded was none of the major, none of the roadways in Manhattan are sufficiently wide to establish bike lanes. Uh, except for a very, very few, and those are kind of the ones that we've already done, right? Mm -hmm. is, is there any flexibility in that, and are you making any headway along those lines? There is some flexibility. Um, let me correct you, first of all. There are some roadways that are sufficiently wide. Hayes Drive is a, is a good example. Um, it's a good example of a road that we can, um, what we call, put on a road diet. Um, it's a wide three-lane road. It's actually wide enough that you can strike lane, bike lanes on it now and, can, and maintain it as a three-lane road. Um, it would be even better to strike that as a two-lane automobile traffic with bike lanes on either side. Um, the reason I mention Hayes also is that there's a huge population right up here in this part of the city that has no way to get to this part of the city or this part of the city. Um, providing them access down Hayes Drive would do a lot. It would open a huge channel from this huge population center straight in to this area also, once we get a crossing. It would also avoid problematic hills. Yes, and that's the other one, um, which I, I kind of got away from that, but that was one of the things I wanted to mention about the zoo. Um, that's got some uh, terrain problems with it too, um, especially for our B cyclists, our basic cyclists. Um, they don't like to go up hills. The steepest road in Manhattan is right by the zoo. Um, it's a 20 plus percent grade. But that's what, that's points. Well, you don't have to go up that. But Are you talking about points going up? No, I'm talking about uh, um, Wilmar. Wilmar. It's actually the road that when we hire our um, people to, to do our um, salt trucks for the winter, that's their final test. <laughs> they have to salt that road. They have to drive a dump truck up that road when it's ice and snow covered. That's the one that goes back behind. The it's zoo behind the zoo, and yeah. yeah. Um, and we would never, yeah. And that we would never put a bike lane on that. But I use that as an example of the the extreme terrain around the zoo. Yeah. And that's prob that's one of the reasons that we're not focusing on. We want to spend. We want to get bang for our buck. We want to put bike lanes where people are going to use them the most right now. Um, and that kind of goes back to our open house that's coming up in a week. One of the things I'm doing is we'll provide several of these maps around the building. Um, and I'm going to have crayons or markers or fingernail polish or whatever I can, lipstick, whatever, out. And I want people to come up and mark on this. I want to say, hey, I live right here. I tried riding across right here and got nailed by a car, dude. Or I can't make it down here because I got on the trail and I ended up out here and all I wanted to do was go down to raise and get a gallon of milk. You know, what's the deal here? I want people to come up and put comments on this and mark on these and let me know. You know, where where is my population of cyclists? Where are they living? Where are they coming from? And where are they going to? And then how can we start to create these channels for them to use? Yeah. So the concern for the sidewalks though is because of the people? On pedestrians, yes. yes. Mean, Pedestrian cyclist conflict. A car hitting a bike is a lot worse than a bike hitting a person. Mm, depends on who you ask. <laughs> depends on who's lowest on the food chain in the scenario, <laughs> I guess, is what it comes down to. Um, people have been killed by cyclists hitting pedestrians. Um, people have been killed by motors hitting cyclists, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, Little people, pedestrians, are a big issue as well. Child. Oh, true, kids. Yeah. No, I think you mentioned uh, Ray's apple market right now, somebody picking up a gallon of milk. And yeah. I think it's uh, very important to look at what kind of shopping opportunities are outside of mm -hmm. Dillon's, uh, where people might go, yes. so that they would actually run their daily errands mm -hmm. by bike. 
So yeah. people's grocery maybe or a great apple market and he's friendly grocery and to have those alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only that, but the but the small shops along Points Avenue, um Barry's Drug is another one. Right. Um, where people might go to get a prescription filled. Yeah, exactly. Um or you know, anything like that. Yeah. Are there any good places to, to park a bike? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so happy you asked that question. No, there's not. But you know what? I recently secured a grant through KDHE. Um, they gave us $4,000 to buy bike racks. We've purchased the racks. They're in storage right now. And we are currently, right now, as we speak, mapping out the locations where we're going to put up 15 new bike racks around Manhattan. So come, so come to the open house a week and, and put a big on here and say, you know what, I need a bike rack right here. I go down here all the time and I have to chain my bike to the fence or I have to chain it to um, the car that's parallel parked right there. And I came out one time and it wasn't there anymore. Okay. We got 15 seven stall racks at $4,000. Yeah. Are they gold plated? I don't know. We got the we got the kind of artsy, wavy looking things that if there's not a bike on it, you just think it's kind of art. Um, they're very simple, but they're very, very functional. Very functional. Put another one next to Barry has some at Barney's. Just put another one right there. Come to the open house and tell me that. Or let me, I know I'm running out of time. Send me an email. We have um, the Bike Manhattan website. Um, go to the city's homepage, ci.manhattan.ks.us. There's a permanent link. Bike Manhattan. There is a in big underlined bolded letters. It says, "Do you bike in Manhattan? Tell us what you think." That'll go to me, and it'll go to Victoria, the bicycle planning intern. Um, I read every single email that comes into that. All eleven of them so far. <laughs> um, there's also um, my personal email is on there, and Victoria's personal email is on there as well. So do not hesitate. To give me feedback. Um, I told you I don't really know what I'm doing, so I need all the help I can get. Okay? Um, that's a big resource for you. Well, so. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go ahead and turn the voice off now.